Az első előadónként üdvözlöm a panelban Steph Sheert, aki alapítója és ügyvezető igazgatója az Americans for Safe Access szervezetnek, amely a legnagyobb betegekből, orvosszakértőkből, tudósokból és érdeklődő állampolgárokból álló, a gyógyászati kanabisz legális hozzáférését és használatát támogató, nagy tagsággal rendelkező amerikai szervezet. Több mint százezer tagjuk van. Sheer maga is gyógyászati kanabis páciens, és a prezentációját a betegjogi aktivizmus szerepéről tartja a gyógyászati kanabis engedélyezésében. Üdvözlünk! Hello, thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm so excited to see events like this uh, because uh, in every country, in every state that has a medical cannabis law, it started with, with a meeting like this. And so it really takes uh, a few people to say this is something we want to talk about and something we want to move forward in our country. So congratulations on being here and uh, congratulations to the organizers of this event. It's very, very informative. So um, my name is Steph Shear, as you mentioned. I'm uh, the founder of, uh, of Americans for Safe Access. Uh, but before I founded the organization, I became a medical cannabis patient. And I actually have a disease called dystonia. And about a year and a half into treating this uh, disorder, my kidneys started failing because of side effects of uh, ibuprofen and, and other anti-inflammatories. And I was 24 at the time living in San Diego, California. And one day my doctor closed the door behind him and he asked me if I smoked pot. And I told him I didn't. And he asked me if I knew where to get some. And I asked him if I was his youngest patient because I thought he was trying to buy marijuana from me. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize that he was bringing it up for medical uses. Uh, at the time, uh, this was a, in 2000, uh, there, were, there was a law in California that had passed, but all of the media around the passage of that law was basically around compassionate use. Um, so all of the advertisements to pass that law were basically, if you were sick and dying, you should get to smoke marijuana. And I think that probably the, the voters in California would have passed a law saying um, that you could use heroin or prostitutes if you were dying. Like it wasn't really about whether or not cannabis was a, a useful medicine. So I began my own journey in using cannabis. I, I was not a cannabis consumer before I became a patient. And so I called my friends that listened to Wu-Tang and reggae and asked them if they had marijuana. Um, and you know, it's not that hard in California for a 24 year old to find. And it worked, uh, and I could actually start cutting back my other medications and use just cannabis. But a patient uses a lot more cannabis than the recreational user. And so I began going to dealers um, and getting from the illicit mar market my medicine, which it wasn't scary, but it was kind of embarrassing. Um, but I found this group of people in San Francisco Bay Area that were actually distributing cannabis. And that's what led me actually to, to start Americans for Safe Access. So, but I cannot use a pointer. <laughs> I do. Is it this way? Okay, it wasn't me. I do know how to use a pointer. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, as you mentioned, our organization has 100,000 members. We have members in every state in the U.S., uh, and we have uh, members in Puerto Rico and Guam and the District of Columbia. And our mission is to ensure safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. And over the years, this has been an evolving mission. So the goals of our organization um, are actually to resolve the federal and state conflict. So even though today in the US we have 42 states that allow some type of medical cannabis use, 
the District of Columbia, Guam, and Puerto Rico all allow medical cannabis, it's still illegal federally. So there's, there's been a tension between the federal government uh, and, the and, the, and the, each of the individual states since 1996. Um, but we also, we don't just want to end that conflict, we also want to ensure um, that every state has access to, that every patient, no matter what state that they live in, that they have access to cannabis. Um, there's still a lot of discrimination that happens for cannabis patients in the U.S., um, so we're working to end some of those laws. So in some of the states where a patient is in full compliance with the law, they can still lose their job. Uh, for testing positive for cannabis. So these are, this is still work that we're doing to try to end this discrimination. Uh, in the U.S., patients, uh, our, our medicine isn't covered by insurance. Uh, so there's still a lot of, a lot of work to do. Um, uh, we want to see cannabis regulated like herbal medicines. So there's also a tension not just between the, the state and federal laws, but there's also a tension with how do you bring an herbal plant to your citizens. And in the U.S., this, is, this isn't something that we know how to do. So we're also moving forward along, along that pathway. And then our other mission is to ensure that, that actually doctors are bringing cannabis up as a frontline treatment. Uh, right now, cannabis is often uh, recommended to patients after they've tried everything else, or like in my situation, when something's going wrong with other medications. And we believe that anyone who has a chronic uh, condition uh, that, that's not going to go away, um, that cannabis should be brought up to the, the patient when they're diagnosed as an option for their treatment. I'll skip all of this. So our organization, since we started, we've, we've passed local laws, we passed state laws, we passed federal laws. Uh, we also um, create doctor education. Uh, we've passed two federal laws in the U.S., um, that are not a permanent uh, solution. They're basically just keeping the federal government from going after the states. It's, it's actually, um, we've passed an amendment to the budget for the Department of Justice. Um, so it's a very creative way um, to have what I would call a ceasefire. Um, but we're still, we're still technically at war with the federal government. Um, but we have had to sort of fill all of the gaps as patient advocates. Um, um, both bringing doctor education. Uh, we've also worked on creating product safety standards so that those people that are selling cannabis uh, are, are, are selling us safe products. Um, uh, we've also had to fill in the gaps of creating workable programs. And uh, our organization, we actually passed the first distribution laws uh, for medical cannabis. And to be honest, we were completely making it up as we went along. And in a way, we still are. Uh, every day, is, we're learning more and more about how to get this medicine to patients, but there isn't a, a, a cookie-cutter answer. Uh, I think what uh, Pavel showed you is that uh, countries are taking on this experiment. Uh, in, the U in the U.S., um, we have 41 experiments going at, at, at one time. So before I started um, um, the organization, there were laws um, that allowed for some medical cannabis use, but the first laws that were passed in the U.S. were really just exemptions from criminal penalties. So the very first laws that passed in the U.S. basically said that if you, um, if you get caught by the police and you have a letter from your doctor, you can show that to the court. But the laws did not say where patients could get the medication, um, the laws didn't include other civil protections. Um, and so those laws were really the, the um, result of some of these people here, these photos, um, and I know I don't have a lot of time, um, but Robert Randall was a, a, a patient, he actually was a recreational user in the 70s that learned that while he was using cannabis, it helped his glaucoma, and he actually uh, was arrested and he fought uh, against his conviction in federal court, and he lost the case, but he opened up a program for medical cannabis patients. Uh, and so um, there was actually a program for a limited amount of time in the U.S. where the federal government was distributing cannabis uh, to people with HIV, um, glaucoma, and a few conditions. Uh, but that program was closed by uh, uh, the first Bush, George Bush, uh, and Basically what happened after that is that individuals like Brownie Mary, the Corrals, 
they actually started distributing cannabis themselves. And both of these, uh, in both of these cases, they were arrested uh, by local police, but they, when they went into court, they said not guilty. And actually those court cases built a dialogue in the state of California that allowed us to ultimately pass legislation. All right, so these individuals, by saying, you know, yes, we're breaking these laws, but these laws are wrong, are really what got the, the dialogue going in the U.S. of, you know, is this what we want our, our marijuana laws to do? Um, let's see, let's keep going. So when, when I started the organization in, in uh, 2002, these were the barriers that we had in front of us. And the truth is, we still have a lot of these same barriers. So um, there was no legal means of access, which, which we are starting to figure out. Uh, cannabis is a Schedule I uh, drug in the United States. Uh, we have federal laws that go beyond that, that, that create, thank you, um, that uh, actually have very high sentences. People can go to jail for 20, 40 years for cultivating um, uh, and distributing cannabis. Uh, all of the state laws, at the time that I started the organization, eight states had medical cannabis laws, uh, and there were about 30,000 patients in the United States. Um, we, had, we had no distribution models to work from, so we, again, we had to sort of start experimenting and, and see what worked. There was no doctor education, so even though there were, there were laws on the books, patients were going to their doctors asking to be enrolled in these programs, and the doctors had no idea uh, how to help them. Um, there was lack of dosage information, so a patient was really on their own. Um, they would find some cannabis, try it, but there really wasn't any guidance about how that patient should use the medicine. Um, there was a lack of ability to properly identify all of the components in cannabis, so we didn't see anything with potency levels, or really understanding the different cannabinoids. Um, there was no quality control uh, standards, uh, so what patients were buying, it was really up to the patient <laughs> to decide um, if they wanted to use the cannabis. Uh, obviously, there's cultural baggage that we all have to deal with, uh, with cannabis. Um, and then, of course, um, we have the, the international treaties that also treat cannabis as a, as a dangerous substance with no medical use. So just in 14 years, just to give you an idea of how much uh, a few patients getting together and starting an organization can do, um, you know, 14 years ago, there were only 11 dispensaries in the entire country in the US. And they were actually all operating illegally at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. Um, there were, um, as I mentioned, only eight states with medical cannabis laws. There were 30,000 uh, legal medical cannabis patients, and we had uh, a real war between the states and the federal government. Uh, it wasn't just some nice letters from the federal government saying, please stop what you're doing. Um, and the way that we approach these issues, oh, see. sorry, this isn't working, was actually through a series of tactics. And some of, some of these tactics include civil disobedience. The individuals who were actually distributing medical cannabis were knowingly breaking the law. Uh, in the US, almost every right that we, that we have uh, fought for has actually happened through civil disobedience, whether you're talking about civil rights, uh, uh, equal rights for women. Uh, this is sort of part of the culture of, of US politics that I know isn't, isn't quite everywhere. Um, but as, as uh, we started seeing the federal government coming and uh, actually raiding these centers that were distributing cannabis, we reached out to patients all over the country and said, can you help us make some noise the next time there's a raid? And so we actually had, this is actually me uh, 14 years ago, uh, we actually closed down a federal courthouse where they were trying to prosecute a medical cannabis patient picture over here is actually people closing down the Department of Justice in DC. And really a lot of this was obviously that one arrest didn't change the laws, but it created a platform for us to have a dialogue with the public, right? Why is this person getting arrested? Why are, why are they closing down these facilities? So it, it just allowed us to, to have a bigger conversation. And at the time, you know, we reached out to academia, we reached out to doctors, we reached out 
um, to various stakeholders, and no one wanted to work with us. It was, it was really an untouchable subject, and so, again, we had to start from somewhere on our own. It's a very different day to day, which is an exciting time to start a medical cannabis program. We actually set up, this is actually a picture right here of a, of a federal raid on a facility. And so what, what our organization did was we actually coordinated thousands of patients uh, around uh, the country and said that if there was a raid, if the federal government came to one of these facilities, uh, would you participate in a protest in your local area? So over um, the last 14 years, there's actually been 300 raids on, on these facilities. Thousands of people were arrested, and at almost every one, there were um, activists outside with signs saying, hands off our medicine. And again, what, the reason we did this was to keep this dialogue open in the media, right? That we, we needed people to know that this was happening. And this was a, a culture of resistance that finally broke through to where we are today. But we also, you know, a lot of people think of activists as just the people that are outside. And I actually think of activism as being active. So we weren't just out in the streets, we were also meeting with elected officials, meeting and you know, training patients to come and, and bring their voice to policymakers that they knew that these individuals were looking for uh, access and needed their help. And so over the last 14 years, uh, we have set up uh, literally tens of thousands of meetings with patients and their elected officials at, their, at the state level and at the federal level. And of course, in these meetings, we're bringing patients, but also scientists and doctors. And over the years, we've seen more doctors, more scientists be willing to, to participate and actually speak to elected officials. So when we started, it was just sort of us alone. And now these are all of the organizations that are now lobbying on medical cannabis. These are patients' organizations in the US that even five years ago would not have their name anywhere near medical cannabis. And so instead of you know, just us alone, we're seeing uh, MS Society, um, Epilepsy Foundation, organizations that are representing other patients are now coming to the table. And I would say if I was, you know, if I was starting from scratch today, uh, I would actually start with, with these organizations instead of trying to create something by myself, actually reaching out to these organizations that have a shared constituency and engage them. Uh, and again, for us, it's, you know, it took uh, it took almost a decade, uh, but the good news is, is I think patients' organizations are really ready to, to have this conversation. Uh, so we also spend a lot of time highlighting injustice. Like I, I know there's been a few um, stories in the media here of, of patients that are using uh, cannabis in many European countries. Um, people have highlighted people going through the court system. And as patient advocates, this, again, this is just a way to keep, keep the conversation uh, going in the media so that elected officials do feel some pressure to act. Uh, I think as, as Tomas had, had mentioned, there isn't a perfect medical cannabis law. We're still a part of an, a great experiment, um, but politicians can get tired if there isn't outside pressure. Uh, and so it's really our job as advocates to, to keep these pictures in the media. This group over here, actually, all of those women, their husbands were in, are um, in prison. Uh, for supplying medical cannabis. So we brought those, uh, those families to Washington, D.C. to meet with their elected officials to understand that these weren't just numbers on a piece of paper. Also had to do a lot of public education. We got very creative with, with some of our messaging. Um, but we also had to be um, the people collecting the information. So we've also been the historians. Uh, we've, been, we've had to become uh, the the legal providers and really monitor these programs to make sure that they're doing what patients want them to do. Also, just organizing, finding, you know, I, I actually have spent a lot of the last 10 years traveling around the US, speaking in small cities, um, in public libraries, sometimes to two people, sometimes to 200 people. Um, but that's how we built the base of our organization. That's where we found our 100,000 members, was really finding individuals that wanted to participate in, uh, in the future of how they were going to get their medicine. So we also had to provide medical education. And for the, the, you know, we actually, these are actually available on our website. Please download them, translate them, use them however, however you want. That's what they're there for. But these first uh, booklets that we created, we couldn't even get doctors to put their name on it. 
They would work with us in the background, uh, but were too afraid to put their name on that. But actually, just recently, we've began working with the Answer Page, which is a, pro a project out of Harvard University. And we've created actually 25 hours of continuing medical education credits that are backed by the American Medical Association. Uh, so some of the work that, that I'm doing now is actually trying to get that, those, uh, less, those uh, education modules translated and brought to other countries. Legal education, we had to make sure that patients understood the law. And we actually, to this day, we have an 800 number where we monitor law enforcement encounters to make sure that the states are actually following these laws. And then we also have to do policy support. So um, not just, you know, it's not just enough for us to say as patients we, we want this. We've actually uh, worked with the American Herbal Pharmacopeia to create a cannabis monograph, which sets up quality standards uh, for the cultivation, manufacturing, and distribution of cannabis. Um, we do a report every year where we actually compare um, all of the state laws for, from a patient's point of view, and we provide this with model legislation to elected officials. Um, we actually have created a program to ensure that the, the, that medicine is safe. Uh, and then we also have created this Medical Cannabis Advocates Handbook uh, to train patients. What we found is that many of the advocates that come to us, um, they actually haven't been politically active in any other way. So we found that we actually need to train them on how do you pass a law? Um, how do you get involved? How do you talk to the media? Uh, and over the last uh, 14 years, uh, through online services and, and public meetings, we've trained uh, literally hundreds of thousands of, of advocates. So I just keep going here. Uh, we also, last March, uh, were part of the creation of IMCPC, which is the International Medical Cannabis Patients Coalition. This is a coalition of patient organizations um, that are working on medical cannabis. We started with 13 um, countries, and now we're working with 39 countries. And so this is a network of, of patient advocates that are sharing resources, uh, that are uh, sharing lessons from, from their experience, uh, but also you know, helping, helping each other create strategic plans to pass these laws. Okay, and I know I have to jump. So the way that we um, have broken down these barriers, again, was, was by, be, by basically looking at what, it, what were the barriers to, to getting safe access and how could we affect them. And so over the years, that meant because we were alone, uh, you know, doing, having to create the medical education ourselves, having to create the legal education. And the good news for uh, advocates that want to pass uh, medical cannabis laws today is that there's so many more resources to work with. You don't have to completely start from scratch. Uh, so I invite you to please uh, look at our website. I'll, I'm gonna be here for the next few days. Uh, and if there's anything we can do um, to help with your process here in Hungary, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very impressive report about uh, your organization and what you achieved. I, 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 honestly believe that is very encouraging. Um, and I'm sure that many people here in the room want to ask questions, but I, if I may, I would like to start. And I would be interested in the biggest challenge that now you are facing organizationally. And I'm asking this because it's so impressive what you presented, that it's always very interesting to hear what you are still facing. Uh, well, there's actually a few, a few challenges for us. One is that, uh, as you may know, uh, the U.S., a few of the states have moved into legalization. So there are actually four states in the United States that allow cannabis for all use. And, um, and it's actually has, has really confused people about the issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, our opponents for years had said that medical cannabis was just a stepping stone for legalization. Um, and it may be a stepping stone for some people, uh, but the reality is I don't feel like a stepping stone, I, uh, and neither do our members that we're actually doing this work. So I think keeping those, uh, those topics separate is, has, has been a challenge. Um, but also, you know, this is an experiment that's been going on for 20 years, and it really started out as compassionate use, which means if all else fails, try this. Uh, and um, you know, the, the science is catching up, but we're actually seeing this as a, as, a, as a therapy that we want to see 
as a daily part of, of patients' lives. Mm -hmm. And you know, making that transition from compassionate use to medical use uh, means things like standardizing products. It means you know, that product safety protocols are not an option, that they're a part of, uh, of the cultivation and the distribution uh, from the beginning. So there's definitely um, you know, people that have been working on this in the US for 20 years that are, that are entering a very different regulatory reality now. Thank you. So, Kérdések, questions? <laughs> I think you did a re really good job with explaining because there are no questions. Uh, Steph will be part of the roundtable discussion in the afternoon, so if you will have questions, then you can ask. Uh, so now I would like to turn to our other guest, and I will continue in Hungarian. Um, Sebastian Bigari, uh, aki növénytudományi diplomával rendelkezik, azon belül is a növények fiziológiájára és a gyógyászati kanabiszra koncentrál. Több száz ellenőrzött laboratóriumi tesztet hajtott végre kanabisszal, és a világvezető gyógyászati kanabisszal foglalkozó vállalataival dolgozott együtt. Gyógyászati a szakértő, akinek 7 éves tapasztalata van a termesztés optimalizációjával és minőség ellenőrzésével kapcsolatban. Előadásában a gyógyászati kanabisz páciensek számára szolgál ártalom csökkentő tanácsokkal. Presentation. I'd like to ask another question from staff. You mentioned that you have uh, 100,000 members. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about these people, who they are, and why do they support your movement? Yes, yeah, so our, our membership is made up of patients, their family members, but also doctors and scientists. And we have um, our regular membership that is like $35 a year, but for uh, for patients, there's a, a, a discounted rate of like $5 a year. And these people are people that 
again, that we meet when we're traveling around talking about medical cannabis, giving uh, lectures about uh, both the medical use but also the, the advocacy. Uh, and it's also people that come to our, come to our website. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your patient is coming. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you for the organizer to uh, welcome me. Uh, I'm Sebastian Begri. So um, as Stefania already explained, I've been uh, active uh, for about seven years in the medical cannabis uh, field, mainly uh, on the research um, side and also as an activist because I'm also a medical patient myself. Um, today I'm going to have uh, a different uh, look on the use of uh, medical cannabis and in the cannabis use in general. Um, so I'm going to talk about the implication of uh, using cannabis in arm reduction. So to um, substitute or to have an alternative to prescribed pills, opioids, or also illicit drugs as we will see in the presentation. So uh, briefly, I wanted to talk about the fact that in the US we see a, dramatic, a dramatically increase of uh, users all around the country because now you have uh, around 25 uh, states in the US that have been uh, legalized for medical use. And so we see an increased number of people using cannabis on a daily basis. And I think what's the happening in the US, they are maybe 10 years in advance from us in Europe, but it will slowly also become part of our uh, reality, mainly due to the work that is being done today or in other countries to move forward on, on that topic. So we can see it's really broad. Uh, some states will uh, only allow CBD use, some states will allow everything, some also will only allow the herbs, not the um, uh, extract form. So there is also different way of uh, uh, being regulated, but overall, uh, cannabinoids, because that's what we're talking about, are being more and more used uh, broadly. So, um, what can be the effect of uh, my uh, consumption about cannabin uh, cannabis and the cannabinoids? So, there is two different um, factors that will that can increase um, this consumption. So, there is a uh, first is the marketing and answer. Uh, we see more and more. Um, uh, uh, media talking about cannabis, uh, also celebrities um, talking about it. So there is uh, some kind of trends where whereas cannabis is now being uh, seen as something that is not that um, dangerous, and so it's being more and more as a, like uh, like alcohol, if I may say. Like it's it's not a big deal, but the truth is it is a big deal. So that's why uh, it's important to be aware of this difference and what can be uh, the implication of this. So um, in the US, it's very strict. It's very, you can see very clearly because you have now full industry. So you also have like job application, brand consumers. So you have like industry behind that wants you to use cannabis. Um, and there is then of course uh, regulation prevention and education that can counterbalance these two, uh, two aspects. Um, the main risk about this uh, new trends is mainly uh, about the fact that it's become like um, uh, uh, banal, um, how do you say in English, uh, like minimize the risk. So in that aspect, uh, this is not true, there is some uh, risk of addiction uh, regarding mainly because it's now becoming more easy to access, so then you will be more tempting or being more um, um, easily using it. 
then you also have like fashion, I was saying, like now celebrities and media are actually promoting the use of this plant. So this is also something to be, to be careful about because it does, it's not doing good to everybody or if it's doing good, it's to a certain extent. So you have to, to draw the line. And also one of the big things that you see more and more uh, different cannabis coming up on the market uh, with increasing amount of uh, cannabinoids. So more and more THCs, which also that's something we don't uh, really have a long-term vision of what could be the, the effect on the health. Um, so what, what would be the main question when we look at these pictures? Um, the main question will be, will the consumption of cannabis will increase if it's more liberal, if it's more accessible? Uh, what could be the consequence? Um, will there be a higher rate of addiction regarding cannabis? And uh, what approach uh, do we have to have toward herbal cannabinoids consumption in our societies? Um, so just to give a brief uh, overstand about uh, uh, what we are talking about. So this is a, a cannabis uh, female plant and what we call herbal cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids are actually uh, being found inside the clusters of this female flower and um, specifically the trichomes. So it is surrounding, it's a protective um, organelle uh, for the plants but also this organelle will produce uh, the cannabinoids. Um, so that's actually what we are producing or what we are talking about when we talk about medical cannabis. We are actually talking about the, the trichomes inside of cannabis. So if, if you can put it this way, when you are producing cannabis, it's not that you are producing cannabis itself, you're actually producing trichomes because you want to produce cannabinoids. So you want to look at the THC or CBD or the compound. So that's what you can see in terms of... Um, of the trichomes, that's, that's how it's looking into the microscope. And this part, the head, that's where the trichomes will be. So actually a lot of um, uh, extraction or a lot of way to prepare the medicine will be to actually cut down the head and concentrate it. So that's really what we are thinking for when we're talking about cannabinoids in the herbal form. Um, so in terms of how many cannabinoids is there, uh, about 141, uh, but also according, like Lumira Anoush is also coming up with new um, um, new number of cannabinoids because of the current research about the scientific uh, society. So maybe this will increase in two years from now, or in six months. I don't know. It's really growing uh, forward in the research field, so it's always constant evolution. But the main things to remember is that actually when we talk about cannabinoids um, or the THC or the CBD, it's a cluster of those compounds. It's not just like one molecule. So that's why it's uh, a big uh, broad of, um, like for example, THC. Uh, you will have nine different, uh, the delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. You will find actually nine different related um, uh, molecules that correspond to these clusters. So, in general, um, these are the non-psychoactive cannabinoids. So, actually, if we see at the big pictures, uh, delta-9 THC is not there, but we see that, for example, cannabidiol, so the CBD, has a much broader, like a very large uh, aspect of application, and uh, also which implies that uh, using medical cannabis is not only about THC, uh, we can talk about all the other, so CBD now people are being more aware about this uh, molecule and its potential effect. Um, but also you have uh, THCV, CBG and CBC um, that are very uh, interesting compound uh, for future, um, for medicine and maybe some future formulation can come out of it because this is like the past five years, people are really getting interested in those uh, minor cannabinoids other than THC. So the overstand of um, the cannabinoids on the herbal form and uh, are linked as a human being to this plant is that actually 
uh, we have receptor directly binding to, um, to those compounds. So this morning, Professor Anoush explained it really well about uh, the different keys of the cannabinoids and the receptors as being uh, a lock today. And the main things to remember is actually the fact that uh, the endocannabinoid system and the cannabinoids that will come around it are giving a balance. So it's all about balance when you're talking about herbal cannabinoids. And that's also the difficulty because as you are balancing things, if you have one thing more than the other, then the balance can be really uh, changing very fast. So that's uh, uh, very important, and that's why also I'm professionally I've been focusing on the testing of cannabinoids for uh, home use, because right now a lot of people are automedicating without really knowing uh, what is the optimal ratio or the optimal uh, concentration for them. And that's why also it's needed more research and. Uh, it's so um, I'm going to start uh, talking about the uh, early observation regarding the, the use of cannabis among uh, Californian people. So this was a study in 2009 that was published in the Journal of Arm Reduction. And uh, basically it was an anonymous survey. Uh, we're collecting about 350 uh, cannabis users in general. Um, 2009 was still the medical program in California was in its early stage, so um, it's not clear if, those po if this population was fully medical, but it was, that's cannabis users, so 350 um, people. And among this population, uh, we see then uh, strictly like more people, um, male population, 32% uh, female population. Average was about 39 years. Uh, what's interesting is that 71% um, uh, had different medical conditions. Uh, some it was uh, combined between uh, pain uh, condition, mental health issues, um, and some of them even have health insurance. Uh, why this is mentioned? Because in the US, health insurance is not something granted, and usually people will afford it. It's some, some people that are uh, insert in society with a job. So we are not talking about marginal people. We are really talking about like insert people, no, like regular people, if I can, <laughs> if I can say like this. Um, so they were all uh, having um, uh, some full-time job, insert people, and with also university degrees. So it was also educated people. So it also gave an idea about the acknowledgement of this population. Um, in terms of knowing and being uh, able to drive themselves in the right manner. Um, in this aspect, uh, there was uh, an observation regarding the substitute of other um, uh, products with cannabis. Uh, so the main uh, observation was the fact that people were able to reduce uh, and get off of their prescription drugs. So this is really, really important because uh, in our current society, we are a big consumer of different uh, uh, prescribed drugs, so a lot of pills, a lot of painkillers. Um, that's the main, and the anxiety and the, uh, anxiolytics um, are also a big part of it. Um, Mr. Pacha are also uh, mentioning very clearly, so I think it's very important to be aware that actually with cannabis, it has a direct impact on, the, on this consumption. Um, then the second main issue, which was really interesting, is the fact that uh, it was observed the reduction of use of alcohol. So in country where you have a large uh, population of uh, alcohol co consumption, then cannabis could help actually to, to reduce their consumption or even to have um, a withdraw um, more, um, uh, more with interval. So it's not like... Uh, have to stop everything, but uh, with heavy alcohol user, they found out like uh, little by little, the cannabis can help them to, to substitute. Uh, and the last point was interesting is that actually also it was in enabling some people to get off of illicit drugs. So from this first observation, it's not like cannabis is a, a gate opener to other drugs, but it's more like... A, Get, get closer, I, I don't know if the, what is the term we can find for that, but yeah, you can get you out of uh, drugs. So that's really, really interesting as well. 
Um, so the, what's the remaining question also? It's what type of strain those people were using because they made this general observation but they don't talk about uh, whether it was a THC strain or CBD strain or um, equivalent of uh, same ratio. And what were the actually cannabinoids so inside that were having this action in terms of uh, uh, windrow effect on the illicit drugs or alcohol or prescribed drugs and the percentage. So, so that's, that's still actually one of the main issues right now. Uh, this study is focusing about opioid addiction. So it was published in 2013. And uh, uh, it was uh, tested on the, on the rats. So they made this uh, special uh, cell stimulation uh, system on rats. They put it in the brain and they were able to see uh, from different rats where they were getting uh, addicted to opioid, whether they will be able to get out. Uh, and the main compound, it was not THC in the study was used, it was the cannabidiol, so the CBD, which is non-psychoactive. Um, and um, they were able to show uh, that actually the CBD will interfere directly with the reward effect. Uh, uh, earlier, we were, uh, it was mentioned the fact that we have our own endocannabinoid system producing anandamine, which is a reward also molecule when we are doing sport of, uh, or things uh, um, that will trigger our, our system. And basically, uh, we have the, so the anandamine is the endocannabinoids, but you have also the endorphins, which is the endo-opioid. And apparently, there could be a modulation through the cannabinoids to withdraw from uh, the craving effect that you get from opioid. Um, this study was a, a review, so it was a combination of all the publication that was around uh, cannabidiol and uh, intervention for addictive behavior. Um, so this compilation of uh, 14 studies in total, uh, some were done on animals and some were actually done on uh, individual by observation. Um, there was two things that come out from this uh, review, is that it seems clearly that CBD has a potential for addictive behavior. But uh, the other on the counterpart is that even so there has been some, uh, a lot of studies, there have never been actually um, strict protocol, clinically monitors with a standardized cannabinoid uh, strains or cannabinoid formulation to really draw where, is, where this effect comes from and so on. So still have more study to be, to be done so we can have uh, uh, more certainty about this effect. Um, just to continue on the topic, actually it was like three, two weeks ago, come up a similar review study from Brazil uh, with Professor Campos and Sores, and basically looking in the anti-panic action, um, which sometimes uh, panic can be also in relation to, uh, to craving, being anxious, and so on. Um, so just to show you that this is actually an ongoing topic uh, that is really coming up, and I hope we can see more in the future about this. Um, that's uh, the um, last year uh, was published uh, among, uh, in Canada by uh, Luca um, in the Journal of Drug Alcohol uh, Review. And basically, uh, similar to the first study that I showed in 2009, but this was m done on a more controlled population because it was uh, actually being um, done by an official cannabis uh, licensed producer in Canada will, with uh, direct access to their uh, medical patient population. Um, and basically, they found out the same uh, figures that in the previous study with withdrawal of alcohol, substitution, less uh, consumption of prescribed drugs, and also reducing of uh, illicit drugs. So that you can see clearly the three uh, different uh, categories. Prescribed drug is 80% of the people that were reporting these. Alcohol, half of the population that they were um, on cannabis and also having problem with alcohol reporting that was helping them. And 32% about the illicit drugs. So very promising uh, application for cannabis as a arm reduction in itself. 
So we have substitution illicit uh, substance and uh, alcohol and prescribe of opioids because for painkiller that's still what is being uh, mainly prescribed. Um, quickly, so we know that there's some potential addiction regarding THC, uh, mainly the anxieties um, that will increase. It's interesting because we just see previously that CBD has anti-panic effect, so actually the CBD could counteract this uh, um, side effect of the THC, for example. And also they have irritability, restless syndrome, which also um, I will not talk, I will not present it there, but if you look into the literature, you can see that those symptoms are actually also being able to modulate by CBD. So that's a very interesting topic, how these two main compounds present in the plant modulate each other to find the right balance again. Um, so yeah, that's briefly, I'm going quickly because I'm running out of time, but that's just a, uh, a case study, so it's not at all uh, uh, significant, but still it's uh, a scheme where uh, Hopefully in the future there will be more study about that. We're using THC to actually withdraw also from the THC addiction to, to reduce the previous symptom I was referring to. Um, so that's the big issue. If the CBD cannabidiol is safe, uh, according to literatures, uh, it looks like it is. But again, more uh, study needs to be done. But it was clearly shown that there was no toxic effect uh, in non-transformed cells. Uh, it doesn't induce change in food tech, no capilepsy, and no effect on physiological parameters. So those are the main issues of, um, of using cannabis and also uh, of allowing your drugs whether it is safe or not. So those main things are actually withdrawal, so we can think that it's mainly safe. So very quickly, because this is a very important topic, uh, the different way to administrate. So right now we see um, many people using her the herb, but uh, if you look in the US and also in more the, the cannabis culture, you have different way. You have the edibles, so it's the way to eat it. E the edibles is a different uh, way of administration, and when it will break down with the liver, it becomes 11 hydro hydroxide delta 9 uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, meaning that it's more potent. So it means that you will not have the same effect that if you have a normal cannabis, or normal cannabis, if you just will inhale the THC, if you ingest it, you will actually get another compound that will affect you, which is more potent, lasts longer, and some people even like experienced cannabis users might be surprised about the, the side effects. Um, big thing, so it's the overdose, when you are not aware of uh, how much is there. And right now, in the U.S., they are making it more attractable. So because of consumer branding and so on, so they are making it look like candies. And so for children, that could be a danger because they could misinterpret uh, it and take it for a regular candy and end up with um, hospitaliz uh, hospitalization. That's something we don't want. And the last point is the new coming uh, fashion, especially in the U.S., is the dab cultures. I don't know if people are familiar here about this type of... Uh, uh, product and consumption, where basically um, there is a pure concentration of the trichome, the gla glandular uh, head that I was showing at the beginning, and it can reach up to 90% THC. So it's very, very, very potent. And they are smoking it with a, a glass pipe, with a titanium bar, and basically it looks like uh, smoking crack. Uh, and that's also in terms of behavior, is changing also the mindset. Uh, so it's something to be aware and, uh, and the future for cannabis consumption also to, to have the right preventive message regarding that. On the other hand, you have alternative to all this heavy um, uh, cannabis product and also inhalation, which have a tar and which have all kind of have problem with the um, uh, pulmonary organ. So it's the vaporization and also the use of different strains with more CBD inside, so to counter the effect also of the THC. So there you will counter the effect of the combustions, and here you will counter the effect of the THC. Uh, and to finish, uh, this is actually the, the result of the test kit that uh, I provide. And those are, uh, give you an idea in half an hour of what cannabinoids are in presence in your product. You can estimate 
the the percentage so it also give you a range of where you will situate if you are 90% or if you are 5% THC so then you will uh, know how to behave with that product and how to consume it safely and uh, avoid intoxication risk and really this is the basic uh, I believe of uh, preventive and harm reduction knowing what's inside your project uh, and the last point that I think is I wanted to mention because not only we see that cannabis can help to withdraw from different substances and to to also help uh, the physical health. So we can see like uh, gold uh, medal champions like uh, Michael Phelps, who uh, 14 Olympics gold medal in um, swimming, that actually is known to be a big smoker. Uh, uh, also, uh, the last golden medal of snowboard in 2008, same story, um, he's known to, he actually right now he's advertising himself for pro-activism in Canada uh, regarding medical cannabis. So it's not only a withdrawal of addiction, but it's also improvement of health, it seems like. But that's not scientific, it's just a case report. Uh, let's see maybe what the science will say before. Uh, some just brief uh, factors of the future industries. and. Um, just uh, an, an illustration of this current situation right now, and why not uh, having a more educative center regarding plants and how to use it so everybody can be more safe and doing the right things. Thank you. Any question? Thank you, Sebastian, for this very interesting presentation that uh, brought us yet another angle to this issue. Um, I'd like to ask you about one thing that a couple of your colleagues mentioned today already, and this is about whether um, uh, regulating medical marijuana and legalizing uh, access to cannabis can be a completely two completely separate issue. What is your take on it? What is your opinion? Is it possible mm. to completely separate it? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very tricky, but basically for my belief, I think first point is the medical um, uh, cannabis program that are very important because that will give the opportunity to health uh, professionals to understand what we are talking about because that's the main issue. Uh, there's big skeptic uh, about the medical, uh, health, uh, medical industry in, uh, in general. So they need to have the first approach of the medical cannabis to get understanding of that. And I believe that once they, they reach to this point, then it will, I don't know if it will be legalization, but at least they will be able to regulate for other use. Uh, because as I, pre I presented, we see that cannabis can also be used in other type of programs. So it's still medical program, but we are not think, talking about the patient. It's more like patient, but uh, because of their ante antecedents using different substance. So, for me, at some point, uh, the, uh, we can already see the, 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 the barrier is very close to each other. But I think that's where it can make the, the, the shift uh, in a more natural way, because that's what we see with other um, uh, drug substances already. So why not with cannabis and, uh, and to have a full kind of medical cannabis program to take people out of med drugs and, and other medication, yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Um, nothing. So then I have one more question for you about, you showed us this very interest, these very interesting figures from your uh, survey. And uh, it was really striking to see that 81% of uh, the users have university degree. And then there were uh, other uh, figures that suggested that these people are more affluent than, uh, than the median of the society. And what do you think, what's the reason for that? Uh, I think it's they are more informed, because mm -hmm. they are more educated, so then they can seek for the right information and not just take uh, what the physician or regular uh, general public opinion is saying. So they will make the, the, the research for themselves, and when they find out, then, uh, then they will go for it. A bit like Steph, she was mentioning in our case at the beginning, as soon as the doctor mentioned it to her, and she made the research, and then she understood uh, very, very fast that this was a prominent uh, medicine. Yeah. Thank you. And maybe one more question to Steph. Your experience uh, confirm these, um, these uh, figures, or what is your experience with your uh, constituency? 
Yeah, this, um, so the study that he mentioned about Berkeley was actually about a very specific um, uh, facility. And what, what we found is that um, the membership of these different facilities are very different. Um, they're, the way that they're styled or maybe the prices bring a different group. Um, but there's, there's in, in outreach to patients, there's basically two populations that, that we've dealt with. One were like the people like me that had no idea that cannabis was a medicine and really, uh, and that's the larger population that we want to reach, right? But then there's another population um, that are actually people that are using cannabis as medicine, but they don't know it. So when I first started the organization, we would go to conferences about um, HIV AIDS, uh, other, other groups, and people would come to our, our table and giggle or say, oh yeah, I smoke pot, but it's not medical. And so we would start talking to these patients, and I would say, okay, well, why, why, do, you, why do you use pot? And they'd say, oh, well, it helps with the pain in my feet, it helps me sleep, it helps me keep my medication down. So there's, um, in, in people that are less educated, um, there's really a, a, a process of affirming their use and basically saying, I know you've been using cannabis every day for the last three years, but you're actually using it medically. Um, you're actually using it to, to treat something else. And I wouldn't say that's for everybody that's using medical cannabis, but definitely we're seeing in, um, I mean, there's a lot of other data about the medical cannabis programs that minorities are a very small number of the patients that are, that are enrolling in these programs. And it's because of lack of education, it's because of cost, um, <laughs> you know, cost to actually um, get a card. It's, it's, for every state, it's like $150. So you, if you don't have that money, you may just continue to buy it from the illicit market. So there's, there's a lot of reasons that, that explain that population. Thank you very much. Um, and now we uh, reach the time for a break. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much again for Seb to Sebastian and Steph for being here with us. And now we will have a 15 minutes break. And then we are coming to Hungary uh, also in our conference. And we will speak about the future of medical marijuana or medical cannabis in Hungary. <laughs>